Let's see, let's see if you wait for me. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you very much for allowing us to speak in this privileged forum. My name is Tomas Clemente. I'm a security architect at AWS. And today I'm here to talk to you about some aspects of cryptography and secure cloud computing. Why talk about these two topics? Well, basically, when we have security conversations, we always start with talking about the shared responsibility model, which is a very intuitive model and of separating. Very intuitive and of separating who has security responsibilities over what when creating workloads in the cloud. And the model itself is very simple. It's as simple as cloud providers like AWS. Well, we build infrastructure. We build services that run on our infrastructure, run on our infrastructure, and our customers use those services and that infrastructure in the way that is convenient for them. So there's a security responsibility on both sides. We, as cloud providers, have a responsibility to create secure services, to create secure infrastructure. That's what we call the security of the cloud. And our customers have the responsibility that when they use those services, they do so in a secure manner and implement the security controls that they believe are necessary to accomplish their objectives. Of course, when it comes to building security in the cloud, which is this second part, we provide a lot of services that can help you do authentication, they can help you do encryption, they can help you do monitoring, using machine learning, etc. cetera. Uh, a lot of fantastic things and services that I'm not gonna talk about today because today what I'm gonna talk about is security of the cloud. And why is that? Well, because precisely when customers start using cloud technologies, there is something that always remains behind and sooner or later appears, and it is a simple question like, okay, I'm using your services, I'm using your infrastructure. How can I be sure that I do encrypt the information, but you can't decrypt it on your own? I'm running workloads. How do I know that you can't just come in through hypervisor access and see what's going on? I'm storing data. How can we be sure that you can't see the data that we're putting in the cloud? Cloud. So that's precisely what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the things that we've built, some of the things, I wish I could talk about all of them, but okay. I'm going to talk about some of the things that we have built as part of our infrastructure and our services, precisely in terms of cryptography and secure computing. And since we are in crypto red, we are going to start with cryptography because that is what we are all here for. In cryptography precisely, well, the goal we have with cryptography is to have the capabilities to be able to apply cryptography at all levels, both application levels, transport network link and physical. Of course, when it comes to the first three upper layers, application, transport and network, that is precisely the part that is in charge of building our customers because they build their virtual networks using our services of software-defined networking services. They define what are the endpoints, they define what are the entry points, what is the type of firewalling that can be applied, and so on. For this, effectively, we have a lot of services that can be applied, such as KMS, which I'm going to talk about, and a lot of services that I'm not going to talk about, such as Certificate Manager, to automatically create certificates and deploy them to the endpoints. Automatically create certificates and deploy them at the points on the endpoints where we, endpoints where we want to have HTTPS inbound or outbound, so things like the outbound, so things like load forwarders, things like, I'll say it, Signer, Cloud HSM, etc. But, well, I said that's precisely the part that I'm not going to talk about. What I do want to talk about is the part that customers don't see, the part that is there, and that is what encryption is applied on, but that you don't see because it's part of our part of, let's say, the infrastructure that we've built. And to talk about that part, I'm going to talk about precisely what is the infrastructure that we have built. Perhaps you are already familiar with it, but I'm going to repeat it again. Again, we repeat it all the time. At AWS, we build what are regions. A region simply, a geographic region within which we deploy infrastructure. That infrastructure takes the form of three, at a minimum, three availability zones in which each of the availability zones is composed of one or more disjoint data centers. So in the Spain zone, which is the one you see on the screen, we have three availability zones. We have three availability zones, that is at least three separate data centers. In addition to these three data centers, we have two transit centers, which are in charge of guaranteeing the connectivity of the entire infrastructure of the availability zones to the outside. 
This entire network is absolutely meshed with all kinds of high capacity links. Precisely to guarantee high redundancy between the different availability zones used by our customers, that our customers use. Well, that's where we start working on the infrastructure encryption. All these network links are encrypted both at the link level and at the physical level, at the link level with MACSEC and at the physical level with optical encryption. Some low capacity links are also are laser monitored. Low capacity means that they are not in an availability zone, they are within a single availability zone. That is the first part, that is we have two layers of encryption to break to begin with, then we simply have the connection to the outside. Transit centers, ensure connectivity to the outside world. And that is always done. In principle, the first part is through the AWS backbone. Well, all the data that also goes through the AWS backbone is also encrypted. It's also encrypted. Encryption also includes precisely when you're building on software-defined networks, which involve, let's say, networks deployed over multiple regions. There, when you deploy software-defined networks, you can do what's called peering. You simply say, well, I have a network in one region. I have another network in another region, so I simply want them to be able to talk to each other without having to worry about building routing rules. So, well, even in that kind of connectivity where you simply expose one VPC to another, all the traffic that passes in between is also automatically encrypted. With respect to more infrastructure, there are two things that we include in our virtual instance service, which is memory encryption and also automated encryption of traffic between instances. But I'm going to touch on this in much more detail a little bit later on. But well, I'm just going to leave it at that. In addition to communications encryption, there is also encryption on the processing boards, which is memory encryption and traffic encryption between different instances. Instances. We will see this in more detail later on. However, also the main layer that is the central point of everything that is the AWS encryption application because it is the encryption of data at rest. Data at rest encryption is done through a service that we call KMS, which is Key Management Services, which simply allows our customers to create cryptographic keys. These cryptographic keys are supported by HSMs on the back end. The service, because it's a web service, so it exposes a number of APIs, uh, typically encryption, decryption, plus a bunch of APIs related to the management of those cryptographic keys. And well, quite simply, when you want to encrypt a piece of data, you make an API call, and the service interacts with the HSMs behind it, performs the encryption operation, and returns a response. Of course, to start with, so a first security barrier is, well, and those HSMs, what about that? I mean, how can we quarantine access to the keys? Well, well, all the HSMs have been validated, uh, FIPS 142, level two and three. And also the keys, uh, all the keys that are created in KMS by default are all created as non-removable keys. What does that mean? It means that the keys cannot live in a usable format outside of the context of the physical HSM. They simply cannot be extracted in clear text. And if you did manage to get anything out by any technique, it would be unusable, at least by the technology we know today. HSMs, moreover, in themselves cannot be extracted. I mean, you can't just take an HSM, take it somewhere else and say, well, I can't get the key out, but I got the HSM, it's great. No, you can't do that. All HSMs are configured in such a way that they can only live within the context of the KMS service in the region that is assigned to them. So that precisely, if somebody were to try to simply, well, I'll take an HSM, put it somewhere else, and then I can play with the keys. Keys, well, no, the HSM would simply self-inactivate if you try to start it up outside the context of KMS. The key access control, precisely, well, since we know that the HSM can't do anything outside of KMS, well, what's to stop us from doing anything inside KMS? Well, control of key access policies is the responsibility of the customers. Is the responsibility of the customers. There are two steps that can be used, that is two steps that are required. One is permissions through the IAM service that defines who can do what with the AWS APIs. But then, in addition, the encryption keys have their own access policy. 
this, what this does is precisely allow a key administrator to define for themselves who can have access to a key or who cannot. What does this mean? Well, well, if I am an IAM administrator and I said, well, I'm going to give myself permission to decrypt all the data, it simply would not work happily unless someone also changed the access key to, I mean, the password access policy, sorry. All that activity, uh, since it's a web-based service, all the encryption and decryption activities, they're all recorded in a service that we have that serves precisely for that to record all the APIs calls in the AWS services. And in the case of KMS, it logs all encryption and decryption calls. Well, there's a, I mean, this, if you want, you can believe me. If you want, you can't believe me. But, well, fortunately, we have a lot of, of certifications on this because, as you can imagine, because being, as it is, the cornerstone of a data at rest encryption, data at rest encryption structure in the cloud. So this is audited by basically everybody. All the SOCs, PCI, the ISOs, everything is applicable. All the FedRAMP, Department of Defense. FedRAMP, Department of Defense, German C5, NS. Well, what applies to us here in Spain effectively is the National High-Level Security Scheme. And, well, it is one of the few public cloud security services that, in addition, is in the CPS tick catalog and is a listed product. But, well, it's one of the few that has already passed, shall we say, that adoption and it's kind of well verified. How does the encryption work in KMS? Well, KMS has a lot of encryption capabilities. It has symmetric encryption capabilities, asymmetric encryption capabilities, as well as symmetric cryptography. So, well, it also has operations. It can do signing and verification operations. But the integration with all the AWS services is done using symmetric encryption. And it does it through a scheme that we call precisely the envelope encryption. The envelope encryption, the way that works is that when you want to encrypt a piece of data, you create a data key which is unique for each object that you want to encrypt. You encrypt that data with the data key and you create a ciphertext of the data. In addition, you encrypt the data key with the key that exists with what we call a key, key, key encryption key, a key that encrypts keys, which exists only within the KMS HSMs. Once that encryption operation has occurred, the data key is simply deleted. It only lives for the time of the data encryption operation. And at the end, we produce precisely what is called the envelope. The envelope then is simply a structure in which there is the encrypted data and the key used to encrypt that data, encrypted. When you need to perform a decryption operation, then you do the complete opposite process. Simply put, the service says, hey, I have a user here who needs to have access to that data. And that user says, okay, great, I've got the data here and I have the key, but the key is encrypted. He calls KMS and says, I need you to decrypt this key for me. Whether the user has been authorized to perform decryption operations using the encryption policy, the key access policy, and the IAM permissions, well then KMS says, great, great, here's the decrypted key. The decrypted key, the service, takes the decrypted key, decrypts the data, and deletes the decrypted key immediately afterwards. So what happens? Well, well, there are two parts here, right? One, we have to make sure that the data key is not stored anywhere. This is part of what all certification schemes verify precisely, that the data keys only live as long as necessary to perform the encryption and decryption operations. But then we also have to guarantee and say, hey, all these data keys are protected with a key that's in an HSM somewhere behind KMS. So that's the second part of protection, right? And in that sense, well, KMS has offered different models of where we want to or how we want to manage that key that exists behind the KMS web servers. There is the first model, which is native KMS, which is simply well, well within the KMS service. In addition to the fleet that services the APIs, well, we have a fleet of HSMs. And the key that encrypts keys, well, the KMS key exists in those HSMs. We have a second model, which is, well, we provide HSM services in the cloud. Well, so if instead of using the HSMs that we manage, you want to use an HSM that you manage in the cloud, well, there's that integration as well. The only difference here is that the crypto officers of those HSMs, 
Well, they are not the same crypto officers of the KMS, HSMs anymore. They are our customers. So they decide who has access to what. There's a third model, which, uh, well, it's a model that's a little bit, I don't particularly like it, but it exists. So we have to talk about, which is that in HSMs, many times, the requirement is not so much that the key is here or there, but that it be generated according to certain conditions. So a lot of customers, what they want is to say, OK, I need to generate the key according to my conditions, but I want that key to be used by KMS. So what we have is a model called bring your own key, which simply does what it does. It creates a container within an HSM that is empty, and the clients can simply insert the cryptographic material or delete the cryptographic material whenever they want. They want. When the cryptographic material is there, well, you can perform encryption and decryption operations. When it is not, well, you cannot. And since last year, we have a fourth model, which is precisely the integration with HSMs completely external to AWS. What happens? All those three models that I mentioned before, everything happens within an infrastructure that is managed by us. Well, well, now we have a fourth model where our customers build their HSM infrastructure uh, and KMS interacts with that HSM infrastructure that our customers run. There are certain considerations with respect to precisely connectivity between KMS and the customer's HSM fleet with respect to API specifications that we have created with our customers. API specifications that we have created with the largest, let's say, uh, with all the HSM providers that exist in the world, HSM providers that exist in the world that, well, we have simply defined a standard of APIs to talk between HSM and KMS of specific APIs. And, well, all this has to be built, right? But the idea is that the keys, which encrypt keys, are in the client's HSMs. Client. But, of course, to integrate this into an envelope encryption scheme, well, we've had to make some modifications. We had to add things on top of the current envelope encryption scheme. And it's a very simple thing. We call it double encryption. The data here, at the time of encrypting it with the data key, it's encrypted first with a key that exists in an HSM in AWS, and secondly, with the key that exists outside of AWS. And then it goes into the envelope. It's as simple as the key is encrypted twice. I mean, it's not a structure, as I've heard sometimes, that says, well, we encrypt the key with the key with the key with the key as if they were one of these Russian dolls, the mammoth or whatever. No, it's just that the key, the ciphertext, is simply a ciphertext that is encrypted twice. One with a key that is in an HSM in AWS and the other with a key that is in an HSM that is on a customer-managed HSM. It's as simple as that. And, uh, well, the truth is that uh, KMS has a hell of a lot more considerations and a hell of a lot more details, particularly with regard to, for example, what I mentioned earlier about HSMs, that they can only live within the KMS perimeter, etc., of the HSM domain by region. There are many, many more things with respect to key creation algorithms, etc. It's all perfectly publicly available in a white paper which is precisely the written detail of KMS, which is publicly available. Here is the QR. Use it as you wish. And if you have any questions, we are here to help you. And well, now, for the second part, I would like to talk about secure switching. And with respect to secure computing, well, well, secure computing, from our customer's side, they initially think of it as the problem that I talked about at the beginning, right? I'm running workloads, I'm doing computing on infrastructure that doesn't belong to me. How do I know that nobody can come in and look at what's inside? So that's a first domain of secure computing that in order to explain how we arrived at the solution, well, I have to go back a little bit in time and I have to go back precisely to the beginnings of AWS. When we launched our first cloud computing service back in the year of the year, with a beta of our EC2 service, in which we brought out the first instance model, which was what you have here. Nothing spectacular, right? Well, a 1.7 processor, a 175 memory, a network interface of 250 megabytes per second, and a 160 gigabyte hard disk. Gigabytes, nothing magical, but well, for the year 2006, well, it almost seems so. Now we are much further ahead. The point is that from 2006 until about 2012, all the instance families that we were creating and launching all used the hypervisor model in Cindy. 
And uh, after six years, we started to realize that this had some problems that we wanted to fix. Two in particular. One was that the hypervisor model with send was consuming an awful lot of computing capacity just to run. We were estimating that about 30% of our entire compute fleet worldwide was just destined to be able to run hypervisors. So that only left the remaining 70% to be able to create instances for our customers. To be able to create instances for our customers. The second one is precisely DOM0, right? I mean, the send hypervisor has the zero DOM capability. DOM0 is there. You can't remove it. You simply can't remove it. And that gives administrator access. It gives root access that effectively allows you to interact with the virtual machines that are created on top of the hypervisor. Of course, DOM0 is a pretty complicated piece of software. Hypervisors do very complicated things. Uh, but we started trying to figure out how we could solve this problem. We got together with an external company then, uh, which is called Annapurna Labs, which, well, over time, well, we eventually ended up buying it, and now they work with us very closely. And we've created a lot of things in terms of hardware and software, and we tried to start figuring out, well, how can we solve this? How can we get rid of... I mean, solve these two problems. And we started to look at everything that is the DOM0 hypervisor stack and the capabilities, the multiple capabilities that a hypervisor has to give in terms of monitoring, management, networking, in terms of storage. We try to know it as if it's a software monolith. This is a monolith that gives a lot of functions, and this we have to try to break it somehow. At that time in AWS, maybe we were not hypervisor experts, but we had a lot of experience in breaking monoliths, and that's what we started to do with this. We also started to look at, say, well, okay, it's a monolith, let's try to take out functions out of the hypervisor inside the server where the workloads are running and put them somewhere else, but where do we put them? Then we start laying the foundation for what we consider secure computing, or at least the secure computing principles that we apply today at AWS, which is simply secure computing through combinations of software and specific hardware that is specifically designed to perform a function. Basically, what we've tried to do is to take each of those functions that the hypervisors perform so that we can, that the hypervisors perform so that we can create virtual machines and export them to specific hardware that we have specifically created just to fulfill each of these functions each of those functions. So we started with the part that was easiest for us, which is precisely software-defined networking. We took the networking stack out of the hypervisor and put it on specific hardware. Uh, the second part, the storage part, by the end of the year, uh, we had already taken it out as well. And what cost us the most was precisely the last part, the one related to the Donchero, which, as I said, is a complicated piece of software. A complicated piece of software. There are things like instance health monitoring and things like that, which is relatively simple, but things like device models and mapping to the hardware underneath is very complicated. Underneath is very complicated. And this already took us three years, but in the end, since the end of the decade of the decade of 2017, if I remember correctly, so we were able to say, okay, from now on, from now on, we have this system which is Nitro, in which we have done precisely that. We have taken all the functions out of the hypervisor, we have built them in hardware, which is attached via PCI Express interface. They are attached to the server, to the server where the client instances are built. Still, there is still a hypervisor, but it is a hypervisor that has been modified to do absolutely the minimum. Its only function is to allocate, to do the mapping between the virtual resources and the physical resources underneath, exposed by these hardware cards which now take care of all the storage functions, all the networking functions, and they also perform the hypervisor management functions. In itself, in a little bit more detail, the system as a whole has like four main components. One is the cards. These are precisely the hardware modules that we've created to perform functions that were previously performed by the hypervisor that we now perform in hardware. I'm going to talk in a moment in more detail about each of these cards. Then we have a Nitro security chip, which is precisely something that is a microcontroller that's embedded on the backplane of the servers where are deployed, where the capacity is that our customers reserve to run their workloads. 
and whose main purpose is precisely to guarantee the integrity of the whole system. To ensure that nobody has touched the hardware, nobody has touched the firmware, nobody has touched the software that runs on the Nitro instances before making all that computing capacity available to the customers, available to customers. Here's the hypervisor. As I said, it's a lightweight hypervisor. It's based on Linux and KBM, whose function is precisely to map the virtual resources that are needed by each of the virtual machines that are created on the server and the physical resources underneath. In terms of memory processing, what it does is to activate inside the chips the bits VTX, VTD, etc. that it needs to interact with the processor. The cards create the virtual resources and put them to the virtual instances. And once it has done all that mapping, it simply gets out of the way. It has no more interaction. It doesn't participate in any interaction between processor, memory, and virtual resources. It's simply out of the way. This is precisely what allows us to offer a performance that is practically 100%. We have benchmarked physical instances against instances with the Nitro system, and the performance is virtually similar to any directly physical interaction without hypervisor. There's also something, a fourth component that we've recently released, which is a module for TPM. The module for TPM, all of these cards, as you can imagine, they all have their own TPM, but these are capabilities that are not available for the virtual instances. The instances, well, this is available for the cards to use for each of their own purposes. But, well, there's also a lot of customers have asked us already, but I have a UEFI secure boot. I need a TPM on my virtual instances. How can I have that? Well, so what we did was we created one more card, one more module, and we integrated it into, and the, integrated system. into the system. From an architectural point of view, what does this actually look like? Well, well, as you can imagine, what we have is, on the one hand, a server, which is basically CPU and memory. It has no physical interface, it has no network interface, it has no console interface, it's completely isolated. And on the other hand, what we have are PCI cards that are connected by the PCI bus to that server, and then we have a server that's basically CPU To that and memory. server, which in the end, if you look at it well, it has become a kind of peripheral. There is one particular card, one card, sorry, which is the Nitro controller, which is the element, the card, that now performs all the management functions that were previously attributed to your hypervisor. In a way, now the server is that Nitro card. What we have done is to turn the network interfaces into a peripheral. The network interfaces into a peripheral on a specific card, the interfaces that are intended for local and remote storage on other specific cards, which is also another peripheral, and in the end, the CPU and the memory where the workloads run is simply another peripheral of the Nitro controller. The model is a little bit inverted, but precisely what this allows us to do is to create a physical boundary between where AWS is going to operate and where our customers are going to operate. We only touch the parts that have to do with the cards. What happens inside that server? that doesn't have any kind of physical interface or logical interface to try to connect to, well, it's simply not possible. We're not going to touch it. We don't want to touch it. A little bit more in detail about the cards because you have to know what they do. We have mainly a Nitro card for everything that is VPCs, that is software-defined networks. When you create a software-defined network, that software-defined network is configured through the Nitro controller, so you have to know what they do. Through the Nitro controller, it comes to the client's software-defined network control plane commands, which say, I need to create a subnet that does this. A subnet that does this, I need so many interfaces. I need so many, I mean, I have a subnet that works here. This is inside a VPC that has this identifier. The instances are created. They are assigned virtual network interfaces to the instance. And those virtual network interfaces are assigned, well, according to the software defined, all this is not done, is not done inside what used to be the server, now it is done inside a specific physical card. Sorry, a couple of details regarding the drivers. Well, the card offers two types of drivers. One is what we call an elastic network adapter. 
which is a typical network interface, which is a typical network interface, which we can simply, we can simply add different network interfaces to provide different types of capability to the instances underneath. If you look at it, the Nitro card for VPC is something as simple as a box that on the one hand has a PCI interface and on the other hand has a bunch of network interfaces. So what the card does is precisely aggregate, segregate, section all that available network capacity according to the needs of whatever it has on top of it. And when it produces that aggregation, it offers that as if it were a single virtual interface to the instance above it. So what's going on here? Well, well, there are other types of network interfaces, such as those that are needed for HPC, for high-performance computing, which typically use specific libraries that tend to go over what is the kernel of the machine. Yeah, so these types of interfaces using the Nitro cards can also be created. That's what's called NFA, Elastic Fabric Adapter, which is created specifically for HPC purposes. As I said before, everything that is the Nitro card takes care of what is the software-defined network data plane. Cancellation, security groups, all the HPC routing, whatever it takes. In addition, the card has its own TPM, and through this TPM, what it does is it automatically encrypts all the traffic automatically encrypt all the traffic that passes through the card. And uh, as I said, on the other side, it has a lot of network interfaces. So that means that in aggregate, the card can support up to a few gigabits per second of traffic. Then you section it according to the capabilities and the needs of each type of instance. Then we have two cards that are for storage. One is for EBS, which is our remote storage system via network, which, well, you can imagine that it is a card that on the one hand has a PCI connector that goes to the server board and on the other hand has network interfaces, not as much as a VPC card, but network interfaces that precisely are connected to a dedicated network that takes them to the virtual network volumes, virtual network volumes. In this sense, all operations with the virtual volumes are managed through this card. When we need an instance that has three virtual volumes attached. The card says, OK, I know where they are. These are these three virtual volumes. I'm going to expose them. The as an interface as a network attached volume to the network, to the instance above it. It also handles precisely the encryption. If the volume is encrypted with a system such as KMS, for example, then the volume encryption or decryption operations are not carried out by the server on which the workloads run, but by the direct card. Then we have another card that is a little bit more special, which is precisely for local storage. You have a card that, again, on the one hand, a PCI connector, and then what you have is a bunch of SSD modules. NVMe, which are simply attached directly to the card. This is precisely for the case where we need very low latency, right? Read operations. So simply, instead of using network storage, storage, we use physical storage as close as possible to the server. Physical storage as close as possible to the server. And the operation is exactly the same. If those volumes that are in there are encrypted or whatever, that's taken care of by the whole card. And then we have the heart of the system, which is the controller, the Nitro controller is a controller in which we have taken out all the management functions of the hypervisor. We have taken them out on that controller on that specific card. That specific card precisely offers a series of APIs. All the operations that are done by Nitro, that is to say, the controller has been designed in such a way that there is nothing such as a console access, an interactive access, a web interface, no, the only thing that it offers is a very specific set of APIs that serve for operations on the hypervisor. It acts as the heart of the system, i.e., it is also in charge of controlling all the other cards. And it also has the element through which we can update the software of all the cards and all the drivers if necessary. The security chip. The security chip, as I said before, is a microcontroller that is inside the motherboard. What this security chip does is that all input and output operations that go to non-volatile, 
to non-volatile storage, that is to say in a server, well, you know, there are elements like a VMC, a elements like a VMC, a motherboard controller, and things like that, that will not I mean, they are very often used uh, precisely to try to inject things directly into the hardware firmware, into the firmware of the servers that are running virtual loads. The security chip is designed in such a way that it intercepts all inbound and outbound calls to non-volatile storage. If those calls do not come from the Nitro controller, and this is something we can verify through the electronic signatures of the operations, they are simply not accepted. This is what it does then. Any call from any virtual instance, either to the hypervisor or to elements that exist physically inside the motherboard, the chip is simply going to block them. Then, well, as I said, the fourth element was the element, well, the TPM that does it. It helped us also to do VF reboot. This is as simple as, well, a TPM, a trusted platform module that exposes itself to the virtual instances if they need it. This, of course, as the purpose of having this element is to provide our customers the ability to verify the integrity of the images that they are running. These are things that exist in the physical world, like FI Secure Boot, etc. Well, through this PCI Express Card controller, well, through this PCI Express Card, well, you can do the same functionality through the Nitro system. Sure, this is all well and good. I mean, great, what a nice machine. Thanks for telling us all about it, but what's the point of this in security? Where's the secure computing here? Well, well, precisely secure computing was part of the design that we had in mind, precisely to answer the first question, which was how can I be secure? Question, which was how can I be sure that you, as operators of the infrastructure, can't see what's going on with my computing resources? What happens to my cloud computing resources? Well, we have designed a system to do just that. We have designed a system to do just that, to make a total isolation between the parts where the cloud computing, the parts where our workloads run, the servers, and the parts where we need to operate, which are the cards. We have created specific cards that serve a single function, and with which, in other words, we avoid the work of having to protect access to the hardware. The hardware where the client support runs, i.e. the server, does not have any physical access. The hypervisor, eh, moreover, as I told you before, is designed in such a way that it has to do one thing only, and it has to do it very well, which is to make a total isolation of the virtual resources that belong to each of the instances. So once it has produced an assistance, it has produced the mapping of virtual resources, physical resources, it simply removes itself from the equation and never interacts again. And the only thing you have to do is to make sure that that isolation between different instances occurs. The instances between themselves don't share CPUs, they don't share caches, they don't share absolutely nothing, so that allocation is maintained a stack. That is particular to the virtual instance that has been created. And then we have one thing, a communications passive design, which has been created as part of all of this. All of these elements are not active elements. That is, they don't start doing things just because. They're all listening. When they get orders of, I need you to do this, they say, okay, and now I get to work when they need to create network interfaces, when they need to create virtual volumes, when they need to create CPU allocations or new virtual instances that are going to be created, that's when they get going. The hypervisor allocates the virtual resources, the network cards reserve capacity, they provide the physical resources to the virtual instances. And that's it, and from there, they disappear and never touch anything again. And of course, all this is guaranteed by integrity, the security chip, as I said before, has a mission, and it is precisely to make sure that no hardware element, no software element of the whole system is deviating from what it should be. It monitors absolutely everything before making that computing capacity available to the system, to the service, to start it up. When you shut down an instance, a physical server is shut down and brought back up. The controller and the security chip verifies that the whole system is fully intact before they say, okay, now you can start creating virtual instances in here. We also have data plane protection. The data plane, which is the hardware that our customer support runs on, 
well, as I said, there's no physical access, there's no console access, there's no SSH access. The hypervisor doesn't even have a TCP stack. We've removed it because that's already taken care of by the, the card takes care of that. There is no root access, there is no admin access. There is a controller that provides APIs, and within those APIs, there are some APIs that perform administrative functions. In other words, we have decided to operate this infrastructure. This is what we need. None of the APIs give any kind of access to content, nor to data, nor to memory, nor to CPUs, nor to remote or local data. To remote or local data that are controlled by the system. In addition, using those APIs, as you can imagine, they need a strong binding. They work through dedicated networks, so you cannot can, there is, no, there is no logic that this controller, which is the one that controls everything that happens inside the system to be connected from a party that is outside of AWS and even from inside AWS, nothing gives access to our customers' data. This also includes the debug API. And well, do you remember earlier I mentioned inter-instance encryption and memory encryption. Sure, it's just that now that you see how the system is designed, well, you can say, sure, now I understand how it can be, and it's relatively obvious. The fact that the hypervisor only serves to allocate physical resources, and once it has done that, it is removed, what it allows is to offer all our customers who want to use virtual instances practically direct access to the physical resources behind. And if to offer them directly to our customers. One of these things is precisely inter-instance encryption. The encryption between instances, as I told you, the VPC card has its own trusted platform module that automatically encrypts the traffic. Of course, in an automated way, if the traffic exit point is a Nitro card and the traffic destination point is another Nitro card, what it's going to do is, okay, we speak the same language, we know how to encrypt this, and it's automatically going to encrypt the traffic between the two cards. The only condition for this is precisely that there are no active elements in that network communication. That is to say that it does not pass through elements such as balancers, that it does not pass through active elements such as rotors, NAT gateways, or whatever. NAT gateways or whatever, or encapsulation or whatever, they have to be, be let's say, directly connected. They have to be instances that live within the same region. As long as they're within the same region, it's automatically encrypted by the cards. And because it's done by the hardware, there's no impact whatsoever within the performance of the network. The other thing it offers is precisely the memory encryption. Since we don't have hypervisor and we can directly access the physical resources, so there precisely we can offer memory encryption through the Graviton processors, through the Xeon processors, through the AMD processors. When you select, basically, if we want to use memory encryption, all we have to do is select the right type of instances, which implies that the hardware underneath has these capabilities. And from there, it's all straightforward. Of course, now this part is already, we can go a little bit further, right? We can go a little bit further because, as I said, the secure computing part it's a part in what we call the first secure computing domain, right? It's the domain in which customers want to protect themselves from us as infrastructure operators. But uh, talking to a lot of customers, well, we realized, or they also realized that they said, yeah, now I know I'm protected from you, but I have an instance, or I have computing an instance, or I have computing resources. In environments in which maybe I have the enemy inside, I have, I mean, the vectors that can attack me are internal vectors that maybe are my own operators are my own operators. So in this sense, we took uh, taking advantage of Nitro's capabilities. We took a second step further, which is precisely what we call isolated computing. The secure computing parts, that first domain, we believe are already duly fulfilled, let's say, with everything that is the design of the Nitro system. But to meet this second objective, which is to protect our customers' own operators, we had to go a little bit further and create the enclaves. The enclaves are simply a part of an ECDOS instance of a virtual machine that an operator within the instance can voluntarily isolate completely. Simply put, a partition is created within a 
partition is created within a virtual machine in which there is no access whatsoever. There is no network access, no SSH access. You can't log in. It has no TCP stack, nothing, absolutely nothing. And yet we have the ability to create enclaves. That is, part of the process of creating the enclave is to provide an image, which is what we do. It is to provide an image that is what we want inside the enclave. So what we can do is provide, let's say, an image with all the software and the applications that we want to run and insert it and create it as the image of the enclave. When we pull up the enclave, what runs inside that enclave is the image that we have produced. It does not have to share anything with the parent instance. Simply put, they don't even have to have the same OS. They don't share the same kernel. They don't share anything. They are completely separate. The only communication uh, that exists for communication between the two is a channel that we call virtual socket. It is a virtual socket which is simply a socket channel as it can be in Linux or Windows. And it is the only way for the parent instance and the enclave to communicate with each other. In a way, what does this look like? Well, it's kind of like mitosis, isn't it? We have an instance of a certain capacity. I'm inside the instance and I say, well, well, I want to run a workload here where I want all the computation to be isolated. So this is the image that I want to use. This is the image that I want to use. This is, let's say, this is where I want to do the separation and separate the components. That is the resources allocated to each instance between the two. The hypervisor is in charge precisely of guaranteeing the isolation between those two parts, let's say, between these two parts, except for the virtual socket we talked about earlier. But what is this for? Well, it is for use cases such as, for example, I have sensitive data that I want to process, but I want to be able to process that data in an environment where no one can see what is going on. Or, for example, sharing, i.e. multiprocessing, i.e. processing of data produced by several pieces of equipment. Say, for example, a party A has one set of data that it wants to process together with a party B that has another set of data, but neither wants to share the data with each other. Well, then, we can ingest the data into this enclave it exists in encrypted form only outside the enclave, decrypted only inside the enclave, in such a way that it is invisible to either one of us. By means of an application, perform the processing we need, launch a result which can be done by a VSOC, and then simply destroy the enclave. At no point has the data been decrypted in an area that is visible to anyone, it's simply not visible. Sure, but to do this, how can we integrate this? And this is a part that we've designed integration with KMS. When you create a Nitro Enclave, the Enclave, the hypervisor, creates what we call a certification document. It includes, quite simply, data about the Enclave that we just created. It's relatively simple data, such as this is the hash of the image that I created, this is the kernel that I have in my Enclave, this is the mother instance that comes from my enclave, and so on. Also, as part of the creation, a public-private key pair is created. A public-private key pair is created. The private key is only known to the enclave, and the public key is part of the certification document. This certification document can be generated only by the hypervisor, because it's signed by the hypervisor, but the values, obviously, can be completely public. So. What we are going to do for the integration with KMS is precisely to use this enclave identification data to tell KMS through the key access policy, this key can only be decrypt data. If it is the enclave that asks me to decrypt the data. In the KMS key access policy, we simply have the ability to enter conditions. What we have to do is get the identification values. Values, those PCR values that are generated and signed by the hypervisor, which are not secret, but enter them as a condition within the KMS key. What does this all look like? In one way, there's some prep work. First, we encrypt the data. We encrypt it with a key that's in KMS, and we have the data there available. We have that envelope that we talked about earlier, in which we have the encrypted data and the data key encrypted with a key that exists in KMS. On the other side, we prepare an enclave. We create an image 
we do a code evaluation to decide if this is what I want to run inside my enclave. We use Nitro tools to be able to create an image of the enclave. A certification document is produced. We take those values from the certification document and we put them into the KMS key access policy. And then we simply start working with that. The parent instance can retrieve the data because it has network connectivity. Network connectivity retrieves it from S3 and through the VSOC channel injects it into what is the enclave. Of course, the enclave needs to decrypt the data, but it has no network, Pira. It has absolutely nothing. However, the hypervisor is able to identify that the enclave is trying to decrypt the data. It's calling KMS. And what it does is it produces the certification document and send it through the VSOC channel back to a channel that is an application that we have to run on a parent instance that is going to be a proxy. Why? Because the VSOC, the SOC that is created virtually, is not a TCP connection. We have to create an application that creates connections and listens on one side and another one that listens on the other side. So what we have created is a proxy that what it does is it listens for potential calls that exist within, that exist that may come from an enclave. This is a software that simply runs on the parent instance. When the, I mean, the enclave tries to decrypt the data key, what it does is it accompanies it with the certification document that it has received from the hypervisor. And the proxy simply sends that to KMS. It says, I need the data key decrypted. Of course, the answer to that is the decrypted data key, but we don't want that data key to be visible except to the enclave. So what KMS does is, because it has received the attestation document, within the attestation document, there is the public key of the enclave, whose private key is only available to the enclave. Well, nothing simpler, what it does is to respond with the decrypted data key but encrypted with the public key provided as part of the attestation document. That is sent to the proxy, that's sent into the enclave. And then the data can only be decrypted within the enclave with that data key, and from there onwards, any kind of processing can be done. The whole enclave precisely is completely isolated. From that point on then, magic. And if I were Tamaris, I would do a Tachantachan or something like that, but I'm not, and I don't have the same hair or the same affection. So, well, that's all from me. This, yes, many more details, especially about the hardware construction, the passive communications model, and many other things are also available at, and much more are also available in all our public documentation. Have fun reading. There is a lot to read there and very interesting. This, as I said, is only a partial view. Thank you all very much for listening, and well, here I am if you have any questions. <laughs> One question, just that we're running out of time. A question for someone who wants to win a radio. Yes, and then you can leave as many as you want, okay? So you can go to the break. Come on, one quick one. Nobody wants to win, I've been there for a year. First of all, thank you, Tomas, for the talk. Very interesting. My question is focused on the cloud HSM part. I'm trying to see who is asking the question, but I don't see, uh, okay, sorry. Basically, in any cryptographic infrastructure where HSMs are used, apart from the typical common criteria certifications, measuring plus anti-tampering, the firmware and all this, there is a specific set of protection, which are the management cards and the operation cards, without which you can neither manage nor operate the HSM. How do you implement that model within AWS? And above all, who guards each of those types of keys? Are you talking about the KMS HSMs or the HSMs that we provide as a service? As a service? As a service? Okay. I was expecting a question about something I haven't talked about, but okay. Let's see, the HSMs that we produce as a service are also HSMs, HSM modules, which are connected by PCI Express cards. I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer your question in detail, but basically everything is done through a PCI Express connection. And what we do is we create two types of users. There is the user that 
the pre-user, the pre-cryptographic user. And then we say that this is a user that is given to the customers to, to the customers to initialize the HSM for them. And then as part of the initialization process, there is a second user that is an operator user. What does this mean? Because it means that the HSM cannot do anything until a customer initializes it. And when he initializes it, he is the only one who has the rights. He has the crypto officer for that HSM. And from there, he can create all the things. The only thing we have is a specific user that is a U. We call it an appliance user, which only serves so that if the client, through the control plane, says, I want to make a snapshot of this HSM, well, through the appliance user, I take the entire cryptographic partition and I make a backup, nothing else. That's all it does. And, well, it also does other things like, well, if you want to put the HSMs in cluster, for whatever reason, well, the appliance user is in charge of taking that backup, putting it somewhere else, synchronizing the cryptographic partitions or whatever. But the appliance user does not have any kind of access to the cryptographic partitions because that is always on the client side. Client side, yes, good. So nothing, let's get some rest. And then at 6 o'clock, we'll have uh, hacker talks, four in a row, very cool and varied. OK, thanks.